Okay. Hi, everyone. So first, before the talk, I need I have some announcement uh, on the tele group uh, stand there. You can find some awesome prices. I mean, it's some awesome game. So please go there, sign up for the game, and they 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 give some great great prices. So you should go there. Uh, our next speaker is Alex, right? Yep. Yes. And uh, did you bring some ants with you? What, some? Ants. Ants. You, yeah. you said you. <laughs> no. Yeah, I have some ant colony. Ant colony. At yeah. Home, yeah. Yeah. So no ants with you here. Uh, yeah. That's uh, yeah. You could even did, but they like dark um, environments and uh -huh. even um, they don't like right that you move it up and down. They uh, are always just in one place, at the dark place, and they yes. are just there, you know, doing their things. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So this is your time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Uh, this session is about testing. I know that yeah, testing is not very popular uh, topic, right? Everyone likes to develop, but writing tests, yeah, it's not so good. But some of the techniques that I'm going to show you in this talk, uh, there, I've been already there for several years, and it's just now that now with microservices architecture, they are becoming popular. Um, some of the things that I'm going to say if you are into the testing ecosystem, you will say, hey, Alex, you have no idea. You, what you are telling me, it has no sense at all because it, you know, it breaks some of the things that I've read in several books. And that's fine that you think in that way, but just remember that if you are into microservices architecture and you start to deploy not like five, six, seven microservices, but like hundreds of microservices, then remember this talk. This is where this talk have really sounds. My name is Alex Soto. I work in Red Hat. And um, yeah, I'm the curator of loftofthejars.com. And well, if you need anything, just send me a, a Twitter or an email that you're going to uh, see later. I'm also the co-author of Testing Java Microservices, which yeah, we, some of the things that I'm covering here are also in the book. Um, this talk is like 45 minutes talk, and now we have 35. So if you have any question, I mean, I will be around uh, HipCon, so don't hesitate to just stop me and just say, hey, I have one question about your uh, talk, and I will be very happy to answer it. First of all, um, I would say that software is eating the wall, right? I mean, that is something that probably most of you know, but currently, if you work in a bank company, you are in a software company, not just a bank. Uh, there is a, a, a really a, a big bank in Spain that say that 40 5% of its business is around online banking, not the, you know, the physical offices. So you are in a bank, but most of your business comes from the online, um, online um, traffic, right? And yeah, you've seen this with Airbnb or Facebook or Uber, which is like traditional business that has been moved to the um, digital area. But as Stanley said, um, with great power, there must also come great responsibility, right? And notice this. This is Windows 3.1 is still alive, and it just killed a French airport. And you said, yeah, but this is like from 95. No, if you check there, it's like November 13, 2015, right? Three years ago, there was a still Java 3, Windows 3.1. And they just stopped an airport for two days doing all the, you know, uh, scheduling all the traffic manually because they couldn't do it automatically. Another one that I really like is this one, like they said, $57 million slot machine win blame on software error, casino won't pay. So I always say that, oh, can you imagine that you are in a casino, you put the coin in the slot machine, you said, whoa, it's like 57 million uh, euros, that's great, I'm rich. And if you read the, the news, you said that the guy starts thinking about, hey, what am I going to do with all this money? And then it come the, the, the casino said, no, look, um, this has been an, a software error, and we are going to pay you one meal and just $100. So, you know, it was like, okay, I thought that they would be rich, and then you just end up with $100. And, uh, so with, uh, with as the developers, we have some, you know, some responsibility. And when I talk about testing, most of the people think about testing of for the correctness, right, of your software. It's, you're believing that your software behaves as you expected. You're testing the, that everything is the right thing and the thing's right. But from my point of view, I'm very, um, I'm 
much of the authors, testing it's just um, for allowing you to change your code. The greatest thing of testing is that you can refactor your code, check the test, and check that there is no, you know, you have not break anything. This is the greatest thing of, about testing. And with Monolith, it was pretty easy, right? But then, like five years ago, more or less, it appears something that is called microservices. And basically, what allows you microservices is to develop, deploy, and scale different business functionalities in an isolated way, right? And well, you have that your microservices can be uh, right in several languages, and it has some um, properties, like uh, you need to discover the microservices API, how to invoke elasticity, uh, resilience, pipeline, authentication, logging, monitoring, tracing, all these um, cross-cutting concerns has appeared because of microservices architectures. And one of the things of microservices architecture is that you have tens of services, not just one, ten, maybe hundreds of services, all of them interconnected between them with network. So it's not like the monolith where everything is inside the same, if you're in the Java, in the same JVM, but several, several services around your cluster. So what's happened when you have this is that you said, yeah, I have a microservice architecture. And I want to start testing it. And I'm going to use you know, the old testing model, which basically is like, I need an end-to-end -end test to validate that everything works as expected. And since I need to test all components on Unison, well, I need to do something. And this something is like booting up all my services in a production-like environment, because I'm not going to use my production. And Beerman, I must start using tools like, for example, Minikube or um, Minishift or Puppet or whatever to just boot up all this infrastructure in your machine. And this works if you have like five or six services. But if you have 50 services, don't try this on your computer because it's not going to work. And also, what, another thing that's going to happen is that you will say, yeah, but I'm create a Docker Compose file and I'll do Docker Compose app and everything works and works pretty well. And the problem with these scripts is that with the time, these scripts became outdated and you just, you know, start um, developing them and just, you know, start executing tests because at the end, the script which boot ups everything becomes updated, so it has not much sense to do it. So at the very end, what you end up is with having a pre-production environment, which is like similar to production environment, and some QA department there executing manual tests against this pre-production environment. So as you can see, um, this model, it's quite expensive, because if you need a pre-production environment, it means that you need to spend money on this environment. And probably, since you have hen um, tens of services, it must be quite big, right? So. Maybe it's not the best way of work in microservices. So what I would say is like a stop applying all techniques to a new context. The context is new, so a stop replicating cloud environments approach. It's, it, it does not work. Um, and I start thinking in another way, in the way that if you um, think about testing, testing from now has been considered a pre-production um, activity, right? It's like something that you do before you reach production. Before that, you are in your CI/CD environment, and you start, you know, running all your tests, and then maybe even with a developer, you run it on your machine, and then you have a QA environment which boot up in the machine, and they try to execute end-to-end -to -end tests, and so on so far. Just I stop doing this, and I start applying some techniques that in the past was inside the release engineering team, and I start applying them as a testing team. And the first thing that you need to do as a developer is just start following the step-up rule. The step-up rule is that rule that says that you need to start testing at one layer above uh, what is the purpose of the kind of test. And you think about, yeah, this example is for unit tests, right? You have a unit test and you, are, you end up by mocking everything, right? You, you have your, your class and your class have a, a, a data access object pattern, and then you want to uh, store something in a database. So what you do is just mocking this DAO, right? So uh, stop doing this and just boot up an embedded database. That's fine. They start pretty fast. 
and at the end you are testing the wall um, process. And the same is for happens, for example, if you are trying to go to disk or the network. So um, unit test goes one level, probably one level that you usually use in the integration test. And then integration test also goes one level, more, one more level up, which in this case what you are doing is just running integration test against your production environment. And then the end-to-end -end test goes up one step layer which is like monitoring. And we're going to see this now. So the evolution is something like, this is the past, right? You have a lot of unit tests, then you have a service uh, test, and then you have the UI test, which is like, uh, you know, fast, slow, costly, or less costly. And we need to move to something like this. You can see here that there are three things, three parts. One is like, Testing in depth. This is a test that you run on your machine, let's say, or you're in your CI/CD environment. You see that there is unit test, fast test, benchmarking, property-based test, contract testing. All these tests runs on your CI/CD environment or in developer's machine before pushing code. Then there is this pre-production testing. These are tests that just runs against your production cluster, but before you release your um, um, application. In this case, you have integration testing with production, config test, or for example, shadowing. And finally, we have the testing in production thing. This is like, no, uh, I mean, that I know that probably the project works pretty well. Let's try to release smoothly to the users. And then you have canaries, monitoring, exploration testing, chaos testing, that, for example, you've seen chaos testing in the Iron uh, session this morning. It's, it, it falls into this category. So notice that there is no more QA environments, pre-production environment, and so on and so on. There is just one environment, which is production environment. But let's, uh, um, let's uh start. I mean, I'm, I'm going to just show you some of each of these layer. Let's start with the bottom layer. With unit tests, probably you have a service A that needs to talk with service B, right? So you need to send a request to service B, and then the service B responds with something, right? In your unit test, you don't want to boot up the service B, obviously, because it's costly, and this is not a unit test. But as I said, you need to step up the rule app and just test it in the network. And this is exactly what service virtualization is about. Service virtualization is like Instead of mocking uh, classes, you're mocking services. And you can think about like um, mocking for enterprises, service virtualization. And you're going to see now the comparison. This is Mojito. If you're using uh, JMockit or any other tool, it's more or less the same. Usually what you do is just say something like this, that like you said, when email receive message with this body and with this attribute, then return. This is awesome, and then you run your test, and then you verify that this happens, right? This is how you do, how you mock classes. This is nothing new for you. How it goes with Overfly, Overfly is a service virtualization tool written in Go, but really well integrated with Java. And one of the cool things about Overfly is that they override the JVM proxy settings, so you don't need to take care of changing anything on your code. So you do more or less the same in the sense that you said, uh, I want to start Overfly, and when I, when I have, and when my service tries to reach the host api.fly.com, and I'm in the get HTTP method slash API slash booking slash one, then return this JSON file with this header, right? And then I just do the test calls. So here in the test calls, I will do like URL, new URL, and do everything that you, will need in your code, and then finally you verify that this services has been matched. So it's exactly the same, but it's at service level, not at class level. In this way, your um, unit test tests the full stack from your class, checking the HTTP uh, stack until you get it the next service. So it's really, uh, I mean, that this is how you can start writing tests, unit tests, for testing the communication between services. Of course, I've seen, I've shown you a service virtualization, and you'll say, yeah, but you are a static, a statically putting there the message that you are expecting. So if the service B starts sending another thing, when I go to production, 
the, my service will fail because it's not the expected values. And this is contract test. Um, contract test is like, uh, is, I mean, I don't want to go deep in contract test because it's a really deep technology, but basically it's like you have an agreement between service A and service B that says, look, when I have, I'm, I'm as a service A, I say to service B that when I, I go to a slash get, a slash flights, a slash a stats, a slash one, I want to return, I want, I want a JSON file that looks like have a name with, that is in a string, have a, I don't know, a, a time, which is a, of kind of date and so on and so far, right? So this is the contract. And then what you do is just validating that the consumer can read this contract saying, yes, when I do this get, 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 I can process the response that you're sending me. And then you take this contract and you send it to the provider, the, the service B. And then in the service B, you validate that this contract is still met. So if service A meets the contract and service B meets the same contract, then you know that both services will be able to, you know, talk each other without any problem. This is about contract testing and also it goes in the bottom layer. So you will say, okay, I have some, some tests. I have my service virtualization test for, all, for um, my unit test. Then I have contract tests to validate that all the services are able to communicate each other without any problem. So let's go to production, right? You go to production, you deploy everything. Yeah, everything is really happy. We touch the production. But then, yeah, shit happens, right? The problem is that production is always production. It's really a special uh, environment where you have a network that its setup is different than other uh, environments that you might have, or even local machine. You have DNSs, you have firewall, you have databases that usually the database is the 99% of the schema is equal, but there is always this 100% of the schema that, how it's possible that in production it's a different schema than in pre-production, right? This happens in the best families. And yes, this might cause failures. Maybe also the weight of that is not the same because in, in production databases it has a huge amount of data and not in the testing environment and so on so far. So production is quite different. So what you need to think about, and this is a change in your mindset, is that production is not sacrosanct anymore, right? I mean that you need to go to production and test things. We've seen, you've seen here with chaos testing, it's exactly the same. Let's use production environment. It doesn't happen anything, right? I know that it's like, there requires a change on your mindset. You have to have some kind of appetite for risk. I know that it's risky, but that's interesting. And also you need to change how you code your application. You need to start thinking of uh, developing your um, um, code, taking in mind that it might fail, not it might be uh, available, everything, right? This is one change that you need to do. So no more staging environments, no pre-production environments so far. Everything on uh, production. Then you'll say, okay, then, I, I, I have this pre-production, I run integration test against this uh, production environment, and then I need to release this new version of my application. I have a, a service one, A, V1 running on my cluster, and I have the V2 that I want to deploy, and I want to release to my users. So how you release to your uh, users, it's like this one. The first thing that you can do is just blue-green deployment approach. The blue green deployment approach is that you have two identical environments and you balance uh, when you are ready. So, for example, you have uh, here, uh, you have your build, you have the uh, blue application, all your public traffic goes to the blue. Then you deploy your green, but you deploy, not release, you run your integration test against this um, release, and then you say, okay, now it seems that everything is fine, I've run my unit test in my CI CD environment, I run my integration test on um, against the service that it's deployed on production. Now I'm going to switch my traffic to green. And now all your users go to green. If there is a problem, you just need to go switch back to blue. It's really fast. It just takes one second. So as you can see, what the one thing that you need to do is just having a monitoring system all the time checking if everything works as expected. And if it was as expected, 
you can leave it in green, and if not, you can go to blue. What is the problem with this is that it's all or nothing, right? So it's like if green goes well, no problem, but if it goes wrong, all your users will get it this error, which is something that is not really nice. So what you have here is another technique, which is called canary release. Um, canary release is a technique, you know, that comes from the uh, coal mines, where you physically, I mean, that all, and you know, in the coal mines there are some kind of poison gases, and that a uh, human dies after two minutes of uh, smelling them, and a canary dies in 30 seconds. So what does the, the, the miners was just going with this canary, and they, when they said that the canary was died, they know that they have one minute and a half to leave the, the, the mining. So the technique is inspired on this, and yeah, of course, we are not going to um, kill any bird, but you do exactly the same thing. It's like, I have my new version, and I deploy my new version into the um, blue, blue environment, and I am start sending public traffic. But not all traffic, but just, for example, 1% one percent of, one percent of the traffic. So if you see that 1% of the traffic works pretty well, then you increase it to, for example, 5, 10, 25, 50, until all your users go to this new, um, this new version, right? So you, instead of booting all the users, you're just sending there the 1% of the users, which is pretty cool. But if you are, for example, Facebook, that 1% of the users maybe is 1 million, then it means that 1 million of your users will receive these errors. So what we have now is another technique. This is an umbrella of techniques that's called dark launches. And basically, dark launches is a set of techniques to test on production without the end user noticing it. So you're using their traf your their resources, their requests for testing your application. So they are somehow you can think about like they are doing your QA manual testing, but the, the, it's done by your uh, users. So there are, as I said, several techniques. One of the techniques that you might have is like this one, that you have all your public to uh, um, green, then you deploy the blue, which is the new version, and then you use the internal users to test your application. And this, for example, it's one approach used by Facebook, where obviously all the employees of Facebook um, uses Facebook, and they detect if the user is connecting from uh, from, the, uh, from the office. And if they are connecting from the office, then they, what they're doing is just redirecting to a new version of Facebook, not the public version. So the users, I mean, the, the, the employees might expect some failures, and what they only, the only thing is just testing the application for the QA. This is one way of doing, but of course, not everyone might use this approach. There is another one, which is called shadowing traffic. And shadowing traffic is like, I have my service A, which is the blue, the blue one, and then I have the service, the new version, V2, which is the green. And now when I get a request from my users, I mirror the traffic in the sense that the request is sent to service V1, and notice that there are a double arrow. It means that the response goes to the service V1, the service V1 sends a response, and this response is sent to the user, but also the same request is sent to the V2. Then, what's happening here is that the V2 does not respond. It's a fire and forget request. And in this sense, you can have a monitoring tool monitoring the V2, checking if there are errors or not. So your, you, the end user will never notice if there is an error in V2. But you, with your monitoring tool, for example, with Prometheus, you will detect these failures. So you can react before releasing publicly your service. And then when this was pretty well. I mean, that when you said, yes, V2 is behaving correctly, then you can start, for example, a canary and starting doing 1%, 5%, and so on so far. So this technique is the one that we are using in Red Hat, just, you know, um, dark launch with mirror and traffic plus canary release. And probably, if you are into microservices, you are using Kubernetes and OpenShift to deploy your microservices. And how you can implement all these techniques in Kubernetes and, and OpenShift, there is Istio. Istio has been also introduced by Aaron. Uh, um, Istio is just you know, a service mesh. Um, it's, you know, it's a kind of service mesh, which is a dedicated infrastructure layer for making service-to-service -service co communication safe, fast, and readable. And um, 
as Christian Post uh, sorry, said, service meshes allows you to, um, as we move to service architecture, we push the complexity to the space between our services. So now we have several services there, right? And what we want to do is just start sending traffic in different services in a different way, right? For example, 1%, 99%, mirroring the traffic and so on and so far. So this is Istio. This still helps you undo all these things. Um, Istio will take us a full session. Um, I'm going to show you in a demo. This is um, Red Hat. We are, I think that we have the most complete and best tutorial out there about Istio, which is in this link, Istio tutorial. And I'm going to show you how to do this kind of uh, releases. I have here my... Um, a simple um, application, okay, which now, if you see, I can do a call, and you see that I'm getting always, I have a service, uh, wait a second, now, uh, hello, step by step. Okay, now, now we have here. Oh man! Now we have a problem. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm going to fix it later. Um, then we have a service customer preference and recommendation, and recommendation uh, we are having here is B1. And I can do a call, and all the time it goes to the B1. Then if, I, then if I want to implement a um, blue-green uh, blue approach, I just need to use EastCTL, and I want to replace how the proxy behaves. Because at the end, Istio is a proxy in front of each of your services which manage the traffic. Right? So I need to instruct these proxies to say, look, send the traffic not to V1, but to V2. So I do an Istio uh, replace, and it's virtual service recommendation. V2, okay, and now if I do a call, notice that all the time I go to V2. So I've not deployed anything, I've not, not redeployed nothing, I've not changed the recommendation, I've not changed the preference, I've not changed anything, and now just with, you know, executing Istio, I go to V2. Then if I'm, I'm going to go back to um, to um, V1, I can do a, a virtual service recommendation V1 which is here, and now if I do a call, again, I go to the B1. So it's really fast, and I just can, you know, go from blue to green um, without any problem. Now you said, okay, I want to do a um, canary release. No problem. I just need to do CTL, replace, minus F. And for example, I can do something like, for example, 75% to B1 and 25% to B2. I apply it, and then I can do a call, and you see that there is, oh, wait, there is a lot of, now there is V1, V1, V2, then there is some more V1s, V1s, V2, V1, 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 V2. I mean that just, you know, checking, changing a file, it just works. If you want to see this file, it's, um, is that, it's this one. You see that what I'm just saying is like, I want to go to recommendation V1 in the 75% of the traffic and 25% of the traffic to version V2. Then I just need to just change this number and it just, you know, change how the traffic goes. And I can even do another thing. Let's go again to V1. Now it's everything to V1 again. Let's do a mirroring traffic. To do a mirroring traffic, it's exactly the same. Replace, minus F, virtual service, um, it's uh, here. So now I am applying uh, a mirroring traffic approach. And I do a call, and obviously you see only V1, right? Because I'm, do, I'm doing a, a mirroring traffic, so the traffic is sent to V1 to V2, but the response comes from V2 from B1. And, but if now I do QCTL logs and I see the log, uh, what's happening now? 
Well, now I have a problem. Notice that I cannot move my cursor from here. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Okay. No. Well, basically, if we check it, the logs, you will see that the, the, the log of service v2 always get it the request. Let me um, try to finish. Because we are running almost out of time. Let me introduce you differentiate. If you see that the request and response in the mirroring, you're sending requests to v1 and v2. But what's happening if the v2 responds something? I mean, that a JSON document which is not compatible with what is sending v1, right? This might happen. Uh, in the sense, with just your um, monitoring tool, you're not going to be able to detect anything because the request, it's well, I mean, it returns a 200, but the content of the document is different. So let me introduce you um, differentia. Differentia is like a proxy that, what you, that it does just do a request to the V1 and the V2, and then it checks if the responses are uh, uh, equivalent or not. Of course, the thing is that sometimes the, um, there are some fields that are random, like, for example, time stamps. So what, you, what we have is like a noise detection comparison where you detect noise between comparing uh, service v1 and another instance of serving v1, you remove the things that are dynamic, dynamically calculated, and then you just compare with the v2 again, right? So it's like it's a tool for detecting regressions between services. So you have services a v1 and services service a v2, and you want to detect the regression between them if there you have added any regression. So difference does this automatically. So you put this with mirroring traffic, and then you are able to detect not only if your service v2 is, is behaving incorrectly, but also if the content that it's doing is producing it's um, correct or not. Let's win down. Test as um, our uh, team. So you, you still need to do unit tests, um, you know, uh, performance tests and so on so far, but you also need to adapt to these new ways of working and testing. So I'm not saying don't do unit tests, just test on production, right? I'm not saying this. I'm just saying this is one thing, but you still need to do unit tests as a, you know, or using TDD as a, a design uh, way of working. Of course, secure your steps. Be, be aware when you just do uh, uh, mirroring traffic, because V1 has a database and V2 also has a database. And the databases are stateful. So you are modifying the database at the same time, right? So um, we are almost done. But one of the things that you can do is just using service virtualization in pods. So you are virtualizing your um, pod. So you have service A and you're just doing uh, tr uh, shadowing traffic. You have service V1 that goes to uh, service C and service C go to D, E, F, and so whatever. And then service V, V2, if you are you know, shadowing the traffic, then this traffic also goes to C, right? And then C go to D and so on so far. So what you need to do is just use service virtualization to not affect all the other services. In case of databases, again, you can use synthetic transactions, which is like something like I configure service V2 to always roll back your transactions. So in this way, service V1, the request from service V1 will store in the database, but the request that comes to service V2 will not store anything. Of course, this works. But it requires that you change, I mean, that you need to design your application for this. So if you, you can also use uh, other techniques, like, for example, Tate, which Tate allows you to create virtual DBs. So you say, do something like, when the request come, goes to service V1, just get it from production. But if you go to service V2, then just read from the production database, but writes goes to a database that is just for throw away after I release my service V2. You can use the same with Kafka. Of in the Vesium. And finally, 
and the three that wants to control me can get them at all, right? I mean, that I know that it's quite risky to do it in production, but it's just a matter of a start. Just a start, start with a simple service, something that is stateless, try it, and then move and move and move forward. Finally, uh, this is my Twitter, this is my email. Sometimes people ask me, hey, can I send you an email? Yes, of course, you can send me an email because I put it here, right? So if you have any question, I will be around here, and if not, Twitter or email is another way of um, reaching me. Thank you very much.